So welcome to part four of lecture three of aerospace propulsion. So the disadvantages of the external expansion nozzles um, have to do with thermal management. Um, it's very difficult to provide sufficient cooling to that spike or that center body region because it's not exposed to the atmospheric flow. So you basically need a series of, uh, you know, probably pumping coolant near the surface and heat exchangers, which is maybe heavy and expensive. And structurally, since we're not dealing with a simple cylindrical pressure vessel anymore, structural weight tends to be relatively high. You've basically got to make sure that that central spike doesn't collapse. So you can see that there's pros and cons of different designs and ultimately um, what this particular design will be used in a given application will, d will depend on uh, the specific mission that the rocket needs to accomplish. We're now going to come back to an important issue in rocket nozzle design, which is basically figuring out what the shape of the rocket nozzle ought to be. And this has to do with relating the flow to the geometry. Right in the previous lecture, we used the corrected flow per unit area equation to relate the Mach number to the area. While that's pretty accurate, it doesn't tell us anything about how long the nozzle ought to be or the manner in which the area should vary along the streamwise direction. In other words, it doesn't tell us anything about how quickly we should be doing the contraction or the expansion in the direction of flow. So we need to think about the answer here separately for the subsonic flow and the supersonic flow. So upstream of the throat where the flow is subsonic, there's really very few limits on how fast we can contract down that flow towards the throat. Mostly, we're limited by wanting to ensure that as the flow turns back to axial at the throat itself, there's not local separations uh, which would cause a reduction of the effective throat area and therefore restrict the amount of flow. We'll see on the next slide more um, a visual representation of what, I'm, what I mean. Downstream of the throat where the flow is supersonic, we, have, we can determine what the shape ought to look like using something called the method of characteristics. And an approximate treatment of that is something that we'll discuss today. Before we get to that, let's again look at the uh, converging part of the nozzle. Basically, it's limited by flow separation at the throat. Um, so here are two examples of sketches of throat profiles. Um, so on the left, we have the short nozzle. And uh, we can see that there will be locally near the outer walls, there will be a locally strong adverse pressure gradient near the throat um, as the flow sort of turns uh, away from itself. Um, so, so this, this flow may separate locally here and here, and uh, even though the overall adverse er, pressure gradient is favorable, there's locally adverse regions here and here, so you could get a reduction in effective throat area. Whereas if you have a long nozzle, um, you're going to more closely approximate the assumed quasi-one-dimensional flow assumptions that we laid out last time, and the flow will stay well attached, and the area essentially will be what you think it is. So, you know, there's, there's obviously a balance here. You don't want to make it too long because then you're adding extra skin friction and extra weight. Um, but you want to basically make sure it's not too short um, or that it sort of contracts very aggressively and then that there's a, a gradual curvature back towards axial at the end. So we'll spend the next few slides looking at the method of characteristics. So a complete treatment of this is beyond the scope of this course. It's something you might deal with if, you're, if you took a course in gas dynamics or, or compressible flow. Um, but we'll deal with a very simplified approximate treatment. And the main things that we're going to do is assume the flow is two-dimensional. So this is a big uh, simplification because we're actually dealing with axisymmetric flows in the rocket nozzle. We'll assume the flow is everywhere supersonic. In other words, that there's nowhere that it's going to sort of have shocks and then go down to subsonic. And we'll assume the flow is isentropic. Um, and if, if the flow is staying supersonic and, it's, and attached, then actually the isentropic assumption is a pretty good one. Um, so there is an analytical axisymmetric treatment of the method of characteristics, but the math is a lot more complicated and it wouldn't add to the conceptual understanding of, of what the method is about. And we would in practice nowadays just use a computer program to help us do that more difficult math. So the two-dimensional treatment is uh, sufficient to explain the concept 
and it's simple enough that we can sort of write down the equations without uh, needing five, five chalkboards to, to try to do it. Okay, so let's think about how we uh, expand a supersonic flow, right? Expand means accelerating. So the, how we do this is the flow has to turn through weak isentropic waves, which, are, which when there's a bunch of these together, we call it an expansion fan. So if we've got flow coming uh, in at velocity v, and let's say that this is following the contour shape of a wall, which is the reason why it would turn, um, then there's going to be a Mach wave at angle alpha uh, to the direction the flow is going, and that's going to cause, when the flow goes through that Mach wave, it's going to cause the flow to turn by some angle d theta with an associated change in velocity dv, uh, which v plus dv in a vector sense gives the new velocity. And some of the details of the mathematics I'm going to talk a little bit about here, but some of it I'm going to skip over and refer you to the MIT Open Courseware notes because um, you know, deriving this in detail is not really our aim here. It's just to try to get a, a sense of how this is a useful tool for design. So this Mach wave angle alpha is based on the sine inverse of uh, 1 over the incoming Mach number associated with this velocity v. Uh, and we can write that in terms of uh, 1 over the square root of, of, of Mach squared minus 1. And we'll see why having that tan alpha is useful a little bit later. So two sort of non-obvious things just happened here, something physical and something mathematical. Let's explore both. So physically, why should it be the case that uh, the Mach wave angle alpha is the sine inverse of uh, 1 over the Mach number, or A over V? So you should have seen this, I hope, in third year fluids, where you would have learned a little bit about supersonic flows. Basically, this Mach uh, wave angle is determined by the speed of sound A and the velocity V. Um, Right, so basically V is the hypotenuse of, of this triangle, uh, A is the opposite side, and the Mach wave is perpendicular to uh, the A. Um, so it, this Mach wave essentially lies on the tangent of uh, this circle of radius A um, and intersects with the line uh, of, of length V going from the origin of the circle. So this is sort of, you can, there's a nice geometric interpretation here. And of course, A over V is just 1 over the Mach number based on the definition of Mach numbers. Mathematically, um, it's not that obvious why the sine inverse of 1 over M, uh, which is what we're dealing with here, is the same thing as the tan inverse of 1 over the square root of M squared minus 1. Um, and this is because the, the adjacent side length, right, this side of the triangle here, um, from the Pythagorean theorem is the square root of v squared minus a squared. Um, and so the opposite over adjacent, uh, which is the basis of the tan function, is a over the square root of a squared minus, or v squared minus a squared. And so if I factor out a from the denominator, um, and I get 1, uh, and then the a will cancel out the numerator and the denominator, and I get 1 over the square root of m squared minus 1. So as I mentioned, also the not only is the flow turning, but the flow is accelerating. This total velocity change is dv, um, and the change in the original direction is du, and the change perpendicular to that is d lowercase v. And because we're dealing with Mach waves here, d theta is much smaller than 1. So dv can be written as v d, d theta, and du is just dv. And so du dv is then, uh, by definition, is, is tan alpha. So we can see why it's now useful to um, have written uh, tan alpha in terms of the Mach number, because this also gives us something useful about the change in the velocity. You can take that result and run with it and manipulate this into something that I'm not going to go through the steps here. Um, this is covered in the MIT Open Courseware lecture notes. But the final result is what's important. And it's what's at the bottom of the slide here. So we end up getting uh, sort of a finite theta uh, turning angle, which is a function of incoming Mach number. And this is this very complicated looking function, um, which is just a function 
of incoming Mach number, as well, of course, as the specific heat ratio for the gas. So we see this plotted here. So on the horizontal axis is incoming Mach number, and on the vertical axis is uh, the turning angle theta. It's not obvious how you use this plot. Um, I'll explain it a little bit. First of all, we see three different curves for different values of gamma, and we can see that as we increase gamma, the sort of maximum value of uh, the Prandtl-Meyer function decreases. The way we use this function is to calculate the delta theta for a given delta Mach number. So basically, if I have an incoming flow at, let's just say, uh, Mach 10 um, and with gamma 1.4, and then I want to know how what angle I have to turn that flow through to get it down to Mach, uh, or to accelerate it to uh, Mach 15, let's say, I would look up this value, get that angle, this angle, take the difference in the angles, and that turning would give me that much flow acceleration. That's how we use this function. So in terms of shaping a rocket nozzle, basically we use the wave systems in the rocket nozzle to set the length. There's a detailed example in the notes. Um, I'm not going to go through. I will click on this link in a minute and bring this up for uh, to, to just show you a little bit of what I mean. Um, but I'm not going to go through this example in detail in this lecture video. Instead, what I suggest is that you go through the example uh, in, at this link on pages 5 and 6 uh, in, in detail but by yourself. But the key takeaway messages uh, from the example are basically that we use the 1D uh, channel flow or the corrected flow equations that we developed last time to give us the exit Mach number and the exit uh, to throat area ratio for our desired nozzle pressure ratio. That's our starting point for the design. And then on the supersonic side, the local expansion angle of the nozzle um, sets up the flow details up to that point. Um, the flow is supersonic, so there's no upstream influence, which is, makes it actually really nice for design because it means that I don't have to worry about what, what the influence of what I do downstream affecting everything upstream. It's the, the information flow is purely from upstream to downstream. So then the way we do this is that uh, we would solve for the nozzle profile sort of point by point moving from the throat to downstream um, based on, on how we want to expand. So let me click on this link just to give you a small sense of what uh, that looks like. So let's get to this. Here's our example. So this figure is helpful to explain what's happening. So again, I'm not going to go through this numerical example. I, I, uh, you should do this on your own. Um, but this picture is nice to help us illustrate what's going on. So here we see the flow downstream of the throat. And immediately there's a turning of the nozzle. This causes basically a, a, mock, a, a series of mock waves for the flow to turn and when the because of the axisymmetric geometry in a bell-shaped nozzle when these mock waves hit the center line they will reflect back towards the wall and the interesting thing is when that happens of course when the flow goes through the reflected wave it will turn back towards axial so it's a combination of setting up the initial turning and then using the reflected waves to turn the flow back to axial that help to achieve um, the expansion from uh, the throat Mach number, um, which is of course one, to the exit Mach number, which is based on the design pressure ratio. So go through this example in detail. Um, take the time to follow along and, and work it out by hand, perhaps along with the problem. Um, and this will, uh, give, give, give you a much better sense of the technique. You can do the same thing for an external expansion nozzle. Here, instead of the waves bouncing off of the center line, they're essentially going to bounce off of uh, the cone, uh, of the central cone of the nozzle. Um, and you get the same thing. It's going to end up turning all the streamlines to axial by the time 
you get to the end. So that's it for Lecture 3 of Aerospace Propulsion. This concludes our small opening unit on rocket propulsion. Uh, next time, we'll start up a brief unit on internal combustion engines for aerospace applications as well as propellers.